What's the deal with those weird wrong number texts? This is a kind of a really big deal, frankly, when you get right down to it. Because we are getting scammed. There's even a special name for these types of scams. And I don't even know where to start with this because it's absolutely crazy. This is a follow-on to a scam that, again, if you've been on the internet for a while, you're familiar with the Nigerian scam. You remember that? Where there was a Nigerian prince, and of course there's a lot of variations of this scam, but he needed to get his money out of Nigeria, and the only way he could really do that is by using a U.S. bank account. And, you know, if you had a U.S. bank account, you could really help him out. And sure enough, people would respond because he said, hey, listen, I, I've got to wire some money out in order to gain access to it. And you can keep some of that money. And that amount kind of varied. And most of us kind of looked at that and with uh, kind of crossed eyes and said, what the heck? How could this possibly work with anybody? The grammar was so bad. So much of it was just so out of reality, frankly. And really, here, here's the bottom line. It worked because it was poorly written. People kind of expected, oh my, this is a foreigner, right? You wouldn't expect someone that doesn't speak English as kind of their native language to be able to write really, really well. And then when it comes to the whole concept behind it, again, they were looking for people who were kind of on the gullible side that weren't thinking it through all of the way. Well, we're at that spot again. And this is now using text messages and WhatsApp. And it's, it's been a pain, right? Uh, it's, it's annoying. So what are they doing and why are they doing it? Well, they're going after you and me in this case. This isn't a let's get tens of millions of dollars from this huge company. It's what can we get from the little guy, quite literally. And, you know, maybe some small businesses, because those are the people that are most likely to make some mistakes here. So what they're doing is sending a text message trying to get you to engage. So it might be a text message, hey, uh, remember me? All right, there's an example. And, uh, you know, this is so-and-so's uh, doctor's office and checking up on your appointment. I'm looking right now at my uh, at my WhatsApp list here. I'm, I'm not a WhatsApp fan. If you want some private communications, you signal, but we use it for one of my masterminds. So here you go. This has uh, got a picture of a very pretty young lady. And it says, hello, how are you today, Jason? Long time no see. How's your family? That came to me, right? Of course, my name's not Jason. I know that. You know that. But apparently, whoever this is doesn't know that. Here's another one. Uh, even prettier girl. Uh, Dr. David, my puppy moves very slowly and doesn't eat dog food. Can you make an appointment for me? So there you go. That was from uh, Eric code 901, as though that's legitimate. Here's another one. You are invited to join the Bitcoin discussion group. Reply with the number one and click to join. Another one. Oh, the same message, different, different uh, place. Here's another one. Are you Kevin? <laughs> these, these are all coming into my WhatsApp. And I, I've been getting some similar ones on my phone, regular one. Here's one that says, hello. And I said, hi there. And you said, hello. <laughs> International one there. It's uh, going on and on and on. And there's a great article from Substack that I shared this last week. If you have my insider newsletter, you have a link to this article. And you can see some of the text messages in there. Uh, this is from Max Reed. Hi, Tony. Remember me? It's been a long time since our last charity gala ended. Mr. Wine, sorry for the traffic jam on the road. I may be 10 minutes late. Jason, my aunt tomorrow, I go to the airport to pick you up. You can tell me notes and flights. I have not been able to contact your phone. Uh, Durant, can you tell me how your handmade meatballs are made? It is so delicious. Hello, which is one of the ones I got here. 
And the, the and Max said, "Sorry, who is this? Aren't you Kevin? Sorry, I think I added the wrong person. I'm not Kevin. Yeah, you got the wrong number. I usually have a lot of business partners. Maybe the secretary said Kevin's number wrong. I hope you don't mind. No worries at all. I see you as a kind person. Acquaintance is fate. Where are you from? You see what happens? They like engaging. Another one. Hello, nice to meet you. Who is this?" I don't know why I have your number in my address book. Do we know each other? It is my business partner abroad. Who are you? I love traveling. Maybe we met in a certain city. Maybe it is a kind of destiny that makes us similar to each other. <laughs> nah, <laughs> you must be a fan of travel. No, look at the blue sky and white clouds behind your head. A good day starts in the morning. Good morning. Good evening. <laughs> The guy sent uh, a few hours later. This is called pig butchering, it, it, which is kind of a sad name for this, considering the poor victims. Um, I had one. I had a call from a radio station down in, not I mean, a television station down in Florida, because one of their newscasters had received a message kind of similar to this, and it was an email. And it was sent by someone else in the TV station. And it had a phone number embedded in it. It said, hey, you know, text me here. We're, we're going to have a party. and I need you to do something for me. So the email came in looking like it was from the station manager. So what are you going to do at that point? Well, so they figured, hey, listen, uh, I'm going to ask the station manager. And he said, no, no, I didn't send that email. No, no, what's going on? And I have seen that a lot lately. Uh, people who have been faking my email address, they use a reply to header in the email in order to kind of fake that it's me. And so they called me up and said, hey, Craig, uh, we're having an issue down here at the TV station. And could you help us out a little bit? And maybe we can do a story about it, which they ended up doing a story. So I started talking to this person and I used a throwaway phone number on my part. So I wouldn't just get hassled all the time. So off we go and I respond and their English again was pretty poor. But they said, hey, listen, we want to have a party, and I want to get gifts for everybody. And I said, okay, so what's, what do you want? And they said, oh, I, I'm thinking what we'll do is we'll get gift cards for everybody. So we went through. There was probably two dozen different messages back and forth, and it was pretty obvious that I was messing with them. If you spoke English, I guess, or spoke it well. I don't know how much of a script these guys are running off of, but they wanted me to go down to the late, the nearest drugstore and buy a couple of dozen $50 gift cards. And the idea was we'll give those out to the other people in the TV station here as we have a little party. And I, you know, I thought, well, okay, where are these guys going with this? Because uh, that's weird. So they kept asking if I had picked up the gift cards yet, and I kept making up excuses. Oh, no, I had a hot story come in. You know, we, we got this thing tonight. we got to make sure it's on the six o'clock news. And we kept going back and forth with them. And I finally said, okay, so I'm, I'm heading on out now um, to buy them. And then, then what do you want me to do with them? And I said, okay, well, take a picture of the front of the cards, each one of the cards. And then on the back, scrape off the number and take a picture of that as well. So you could immediately see where they're going, right? Yeah, this isn't for any sort of a party. They're not giving them away. They want these gift card numbers so they can use them and cash them in. It, it, to me, it was just amazing that they were doing this. It was so obvious. We kept playing with them. There, there's another one called the Romance Scam, which is another one that uh, kind of follows along the same lines, except, except in this case, what they do is try and romance you. And it could be a lot of uh, older people, right? They're lonely nowadays, a lot of younger people, a lot of divorces going on. So they kind of romance you, and it, it can take weeks or months. And then they hit you up that a family member of theirs is sick or something else has to happen. Hey, I'd love to fly to the United States and meet you, but I just don't have the money. 
and then ultimately you offer to help a bit and send them a few grand so they can come to the u.s and you guys can meet and won't it be wonderful or yeah you wire them the twenty thousand dollars for the operation for their relative which of course none of which is really happening none of it's true now this is called shajupan or pig butchering and it has been a very big deal in china because they string the victim along for weeks for months before the swindle actually takes place so the idea behind the name pig butchering is that you the pig are being fattened for slaughter isn't that just something so most of the time it ends with people depositing money into gold trading forex right uh fake cryptocurrency platforms kind of like the one i was reading earlier with the cryptocurrency stuff and they're common enough in and around china that there's chinese language youtubers whose stock in trade is identifying and publicizing these scams so be very very careful about this stuff look at the newsletter i sent out on tuesday morning this week follow up a little bit read this article from substack and be smart about responding or better yet not responding to these scams it's hard enough to get a job nowadays even with all of the supposedly open jobs and there's reasons for that we should discuss it at some point but right now the fbi is saying that bad guys are using deep fakes to apply for jobs hey and thanks for all of your notes guys FBI, this is quite the little article. This particular one's on Gizmodo. Again, it was in my insider show notes that you should have received Tuesday morning. This is a free service of the Craig Peterson show, and it does keep you up to date. It's all the show notes I send off to the radio stations and I use for my radio show on the weekend, and you can get them right there at craigpeterson.com. Just sign up there, and I'll be glad to send them to you. What's happening here is, I think, very clever. Now, I've used deep fakes before. You've heard me play them here on the radio where I have somebody's voice and I, I use it in order to, uh, you know, either myself as my voice or it's somebody else. Here's an example just so you know this isn't really me this is a deep fake that i generated using a special software program so i didn't spend any time editing that you know i could fix the tempo obviously that deep fake speaks more quickly than i typically do i used to speak pretty fast like that but i've slowed down and it is easy to do that just took me uh, less than a minute to put that all together that that's how bad it's gotten or, or good it's gotten Here, here's another one you've reached the voicemail for craig peterson he's on the road or out of the office right now so please leave a message and i'll be sure to pass it along now that's actually my voicemail if if i don't answer the phone or i can't answer the phone and that's not a real person that, that's even better than the deep fake of my voice which i you know i had to feed it some audio in order to train it and i had done that a long time ago but that's just a stock voice that is not a real person and i can have her say whatever i want and there are sites out there that'll have a uh, hundred or more of these deep fake voices that you can use male voices female voices etc so what the fbi is warning about right now is that people are applying for it positions that are bad guys real bad guys like north korea type bad guys so the in, in fact i saw an article that said uh, good luck hiring that new it guy it might just be somebody from north korea so you're used to asking them questions right what's your worst quality tell me about a problem that you resolved at work or a problem you had with a, a co-worker 
And, you know, it's a little bit of a problem here because if you're talking to somebody on nowadays, a lot of people use Zoom. I try not to. I use WebEx. We have a secure version of WebEx. Uh, we could go into this. I, I talked about it before, how Zoom was being routed through China. But if the prospective hire kind of sneezes or coughs and doesn't move their lips or they are not responding the way you would think they should be responding, it could really be that they're actually not real. And we've seen stuff like this before. Have you ever seen the movie Simone? And it's a simulated woman who was an actress. I, I think we're heading towards that, by the way, where ultimately the actors and actresses on movies that we watch are just pretty generic people who are using a face that is owned and copyright copyrighted by the movie studio i i don't have any doubt about that and that'll be coming at some time fairly soon right now but the fbi put up on its internet crime complaints complaint center just this last week that it's received complaints of people using stolen information and deep faked video and voice to apply for remote tech jobs now that's a pretty big thing to have to say uh, when you get right down to it here according to the fbi's announcement and this is from an article in gizmodo more companies have been reporting people applying to jobs using video images or recordings them are manipulated to look and sound like somebody else these fakers are also using personal identifiable information from other people in other words stolen identities to apply for jobs at in it programming database and software firms now many of these companies have access to sensitive information things like customer data that can be used so they can steal your customers some of your intellectual property it goes on and on just think about what they could steal from you of course even cash frankly so I, it's really not clear how many of these fake attempts at getting a job were successful versus how many were caught and reported you never really know um but you know how far did they get that they start taking paychecks etc it's uh it's a fascinating problem so what do you do uh, the fbi is among several fe federal agencies that's warning now of people working for north korean government who are applying for these remote positions so be very very careful about that and it's not as easy, easy to detect a fake video as you might think and that's particularly true if you're not looking for it. Artificial intelligence that is designed to detect fake video, these deep fakes, has accuracy from 30 to 97 percent. They have set up AIs that compete with each other. One makes deep fakes, the other one tries to determine if it's a deep fake or not, and they get better and better and better, both sides, over time. But there's ways that you can detect the fake video, and there are some visual glitches that you can keep an eye out for, like shadows that don't behave like they should, skin texture that doesn't seem right, the hair, right? You might have noticed that in movies before. It's a kind of a, a glitch, if you will. Uh, water is a big one, but you're not going to see that in a, an interview for someone looking for a job. But just like any other Internet crime, if you see something like this online, if you are scammed and I'm helping a, a young lady, actually a couple of different people right now that I think of it. Uh, who are in the process right now of trying to recover monies that were stolen from them. And one of them is actual cash that was stolen. The other one was a cryptocurrency that was stolen. And the first thing you should do is go online, which is ic3.gov, ic3.gov. And this is the Internet Crime Complete complete center and you can file right there if you think you've been a victim of an internet crime you can also file on behalf of someone else you think has been a victim 
and it has a lot of information it's asking from you it has a whole form online there they want the name of the victim, address, telephone number, email, of course, financial transaction information, etc. The reality of it is they are very unlikely to do much about your individual case. If it's over $100,000 involved, then they'll probably pay a little bit of attention to it. What they'll do is try and see if there's other people that have been conned or had stuff stolen from them in much the same way so that they then use that in order to put together a bit of a bigger case but there are so many so many of these things out there uh, but anyways that's the way you want to go is i see three dot gov keep that in mind because uh, right now half of us are likely to become victims this year that's how bad it's gotten make sure you get my weekly newsletter my insider show notes the free newsletter has so much great information to help you out craigpeterson.com and if you have a question or there's something you'd like me to talk about on the show email me me at craigpeterson.com i'm sure you know about tesla and their automated systems for driving assist right well cruise chevy cruises are out there on the roads in san francisco and have we got a story for you if you have any questions drop me an email me at craigpeterson.com. We have in some states seen a lot of active autonomous vehicles. I'm sure you heard about the accident that happened out in New Mexico and a lady with a bicycle was hit and killed by one of these autonomous vehicles that are being tested. Yes, they are out on the road and it is really in limited cities and states. No question about that one. As they try and figure out how can they make these things be reliable because that's ultimately what we want here when i'm in my 80s i would love to have an autonomous vehicle to show for me around heck i'd love it when i'm in my 20s right uh, it just makes a whole lot of sense but that technology is not here yet it's kind of like all of these government programs that are trying to make uh, electric vehicles etc be the wave of the future which is true they probably will be but we're talking uh, really not in my lifetime, it's not in any of our lifetimes. This will take decades to get this all done. We've got to build a whole new grid. We've got to make sure we have reliable sources of electricity. And that might mean we need new battery technology. Uh, what some companies have been doing is, for instance, out in Las Vegas, it's cheaper to get electricity at night, which makes sense because you and I are asleep and businesses, for the most part, industrial and otherwise, are, are shut down. So here we are at nighttime having a good nap. So what do some of the uh, casinos, other places in Vegas or are there hot areas around the country do? Well, some of them have installed a massive pool of water with chillers in it. So at nighttime, they go ahead and freeze all of that water. And then in the daytime, they use that ice in order to cool the air. So they're saving money. It's, it's one way of storing energy. Another way that we've seen around the world is they use a dam. Now, you know about that, you know, you've got the water pressure and it drives a turbine that then drives a generator and alternator, and then that produces electricity. Well, at nighttime, they run them in reverse. What they're doing is they take water and they pump it up into the reservoir when the electricity is cheap there or the demand isn't as high and then during the daytime when the demand goes up they reverse that process and the water now behind the dam just goes through the normal method of creating electricity behind a dam so that's another way to store electricity or to store power neither one of those ways is particularly efficient but it is efficient enough that it's cheaper than having to buy peak demand electricity 
So we could talk about this for a long, long time, but we're talking right now about this cruise system failure. There were, what was it, like four or five cars. I'm looking at an, a, uh, an article that was in my weekly insider show notes on Tuesday morning that you can get for free at craigpeterson.com. Just sign up right there. And this one is from the last driver license holder. Dot com Kind of a cool name for somebody that follows these autonomous vehicles. And these vehicles are all quite amazing because they're using the right technology, frankly. I'm not convinced that Elon Musk and Tesla are using the right technology. They are from a cost standpoint, right? It's way cheaper to have some cameras and have a couple of high-speed computers on board but it is not as effective as what's happening here where they're using LIDAR, which is a laser radar, as well as in some cases they're using radar. They all have cameras on them. You should see the setup on the top of these cars. It, it's probably 50 grand plus worth of sensors on the car. So you're more than doubling the, the value, the cost of the car. So Cruise had a system failure, and it is a problem. Now, we've been saying Chevy Cruise. I'm looking at it right now. I don't know that it's the same, guys. I'm thinking this is not Chevy. This is a different company, okay? Sorry about that. But uh, there's, there's two vehicles in this family. There's the Poppy and and uh, there is another one out there. I'm trying to remember what they called this thing. Uh, let me see if I can find it on their website. Anyways, a couple of cute names. Oh, yeah, Poppy and the Tostada. And they've got others that are ready to roll, that are ready to be out there on the streets. Okay, there's another one called Burrito. So they're out on the streets. They are driving themselves in, the, in their cabs. There's, in fact, uh, lots of them on the streets in San Francisco and a dozen of them, just over a dozen robot cabs that blocked an intersection in San Francisco for two hours before cruise employees were then able to arrive and drive them away manually or remotely in some cases. Uh, so Cruise gave this rather vague information or press release. They said, we had an issue earlier this week that caused some of our vehicles to cluster together. Well, it was resolved and, and no passengers were impacted. We apologize to anyone who is inconvenienced, to anybody trying to get through the intersection. However, in further reports, it's clear that this is not the first time it's happened, nor is this type of behavior by vehicles something that's completely unknown. We saw one a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months now, actually, that I uh, talked about on the radio, where there was one of these autonomous vehicles. The police were trying to pull it over. It finally decided to pull over in an area... Uh, right at the side of the road and the police car i guess the car was expecting the police car to just pass it right it was trying to get somewhere it wasn't trying to pull me over and so they it stopped the police officer did not pass the car it got right behind it and guy he got out of the car and walked up and looked in there's no driver and then all of a sudden the car took off on him again and then the car was apparently looking for a safe spot by the side of the road. So it drove up the road a little bit to where there was a, a, a nice kind of pull-off area, and it pulled over and stopped. Now, the same type of thing happened here, that on the display were the following sentences. So you looked in the window. These people were looking in the window of these cabs that were blocking this intersection, over a dozen of them in San Francisco, and it said, pulling over to a safe stop. And then it also said, something happened on your trip. A support specialist will explain what to do next. And of course, it 
just didn't show up. There's also a telephone number for emergency responders to call in order to help rectify the situation. And the number then also states the self-driving mode has been switched off. And I'm, I'm looking at it right now. It's got kind of a map grid and these messages on it. First responders should contact crews at, and it gives a toll-free phone number. And it says a cruise support specialist is on the way to help in person. And as it turns out, they were, but it took a couple hours for them to show up. And it says, we parked the car while the issue is resolved. So, in other words, the cars got kind of confused, trying to figure out what to do. They were at a, an intersection, and I don't know if they lost connection to the internet or what, but having a dozen of them fail at the same time makes me think, that it was something outside of the cars that made this uh, happen, frankly. So expect this to happen more and more. I'm glad it's happening in San Francisco and not in my hometown, <laughs> frankly. But there have been cases where the primary and backup services have been down. So there's no way to communicate with the vehicles, get any information. It specifically and directly violates the terms granted by the DMV. Interesting stuff. Stick around. We'll be right back. A lot more to talk about here about health insurers and a new law. The Internet promised us a whole bunch of transparency, information access. Well, as of July 1st, health insurers and self-insured employers are now required to do something that should have been around a while. This is a moment that is going to be remembered by a lot of people, particularly in the medical healthcare business. I've been just shocked sometimes at how much we get charged for some things. I'm also just amazed at what great medical care we have here. My family, most of them live in Canada, and I have horror stories from pretty much every member of my family in Canada about how terrible socialized medicine in Canada is. I mean, terrible. Now, you might know that I was a volunteer EMT, IDP, uh, you know, basically a paramedic for about 10 years in my hometown. And we took care of a lot of people. I was, as I said, volunteer. It wasn't a call department. We didn't get paid a dime. We had to provide our own equipment and transportation, everything else, right? So true volunteers. And I got to see some interesting sides of medical care here in the U.S. And as I, kind of an exchange program, got to see some of it in Canada, as well as talking with people. And the the horror stories I can tell you about my family is just incredible. My my brother was using a table saw, and the wood kicked back and ripped off one of his fingers. This is in Toronto, Brampton to be exact, just one of Toronto's many suburbs. And so here comes the ambulance, and he sat in the back of the ambulance. They were driving from hospital to hospital they couldn't even reach the hospitals beforehand to find out who might take him and he was holding his severed finger in his hand for three hours driving around in the back of the hospital before they could find somebody to re a hospital to reattach his finger or do something right he actually says he wishes they hadn't reattached it. you you wouldn't believe what they did to him and and his finger uh, my father had a heart attack again, right there, Toronto, right? The biggest city in the country. And uh, he has a heart attack and uh, he's driving around for hours in the back of an ambulance before anybody will bother to have a look at someone who is in the midst of a heart attack. Now, we're, we're lucky he didn't die. My grandmother, they would not give her medication for her atrial fibrillation. My grandfather... 
they had called and told his doctor, uh, my mother did this when she was visiting him, that his foot was uh, looking really bad and she was worried that it would get gangrenous. So they set up uh, an appointment six months out. She said, no, 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 it, it's, it's gangrenous, uh, you know, pretty soon here. We got to do something. So since it was an emergency, they, you know, they set it up for six weeks out. And he ended up having to have his whole foot amputated. Um, so don't ask me about socialized medicine unless you want to hear even more horror stories. It's really, really bad. And just like uh, schools, public schools in most states costing somewhere around $12,000 a year per student, and yet private education costs a fraction of that, like less than half in almost every case. Uh, you know, you, which is which would you rather do? Send your kid to a private school that, uh, you know, well, education is probably better. I don't know. It's cheaper. So it's probably not as good as public school education. He said with his tongue firmly planted in his cheek. Or do you want to send him to the public schools? Anytime you get government involved or any big organization, efficiencies start dropping, but particularly with government because they don't have competition and they will point guns at you if you don't do what you're told, ultimately, right, as you get arrested. So uh, what's happening here, I think, is a plus, a very, very big plus. I am a member of a health share ministry. And so what we do is instead of having health insurance, we help each other pay our medical bills. So one of the things we're supposed to do when we go in there is ask for a self-pay discount. So this is a kind of an interesting thing, because what I have found is that the self-pay discount shaves off typically at least 50% of the cost. If you look at what Medicare will reimburse hospitals for or doctor's offices, again, it's a fraction, it's way less than half of what they want to bill you for. So they, the hospitals and other places will take people who don't have insurance and you can charge, uh, they'll charge you a whole lot less. Is kind of the bottom line here. So what does that mean to you and me if you can tell in advance what the costs might be? And I'm looking at this article here from KHN.org, and they're talking about one of these people who needed to have some uh, medical care here, an x-ray. And He's saying that you can see that you can do it for 250 at the hospital, but if you go to the imaging center down the road, it's 75 bucks, or a specialist might be able to do it in their office for 25 bucks. What a difference, eh? A tenth of the cost. And that is not abnormal. So what this law is now requiring, as of July 1st, is that health insurers and self-insured employers must post on websites pretty much any price they've negotiated with providers for healthcare services item by item but the only things that are excluded from these price lists are prescription drugs except for those that are administered in the hospitals or doctors offices so this is now federally required data release and I think it is going to affect future prices because even if you have health insurance, looking at these numbers is going to ultimately save you money because your monthly health insurance premium could be less if the health insurance company isn't having to pay as much for all of this stuff, right? You, you see how that works? So it's to everyone's advantage. And when you start doing the math, you're talking about trillions of records that are going to be published. Every physician in network, every hospital, every surgery center, every nursing facility, and every last charge that they have. This is going to take a little bit of time, isn't it? And the federal government is going to be imposing penalties for noncompliance. And they are going to be heftier than penalties that many hospitals are facing if you are a small provider. 
uh, basically insurers, self-insured employers could be fined as much as $100 a day for each violation. So let's say you have hundreds of procedures that you could potentially do. $100 a day for each one of those procedures that's not listed or properly priced. Yeah, this could be millions of dollars very fast for individual organizations. You know, per usual, right? Government is is just power, and they don't consider everything. They, well, we had a hearing on it. Well, really, you think everybody can attend a hearing that might be affected by this? It's, it's Anyways, I'm not going to get into that anymore right now. It's not one of those days. Uh, but these databases are going to be enormous. Most people are going to find it very hard to use the data in ways that are really going to help them or affect them, at least at first here. Ultimately, I think it's going to be something that we can use certainly is going to be something that these uh, PPOs and HMOs are going to be using to figure out where you should go in order to get something done or to buy something and the biggest value of this July data release may well be to shed light on how the different insurers are able to negotiate prices with their providers. <laughs> now, that's interesting. This article on KHN.org is saying that a recent study by the Rand Corporation shows that employers that offer job-based insurance plans paid on average, I hope you're sitting down here, okay? This is employers. What do they pay? 224% more than Medicare for the same services fascinating isn't it tens of thousands of employers who buy insurance coverage for their workers will get this more complete pricing picture which i think is really good there's a whole lot of information here if you want to find out more about it just look at this week's uh, newsletter the insider actually show notes i've got a link to this article there is a lot of detail here if you are a medical provider of any sort if you work in a doctor's office you are going to want to make sure you peruse this. I know most people I've spoken to in the medical business just aren't even aware of this yet. Although I think a lot of the hospital or the big organizations are aware of it. But this is, uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, the people, ultimately, do you make your medical choices based on money? Or maybe it's based on who the doctor is and the bedside manner and maybe the manner of their staffs. There's a lot of reasons other than price that people choose different medical providers. And, uh, and this is going to be interesting. So check it out again. It's in my newsletter this week, uh, khn.org. Great little thing. Uh, there's also a problem right now with attacks on routers. This is really bad. It's called ZuoRat. It's a remote access Trojan. And it's probably a sophisticated nation state. Uh, and it's very, very bad. It, it is affecting d these routers, these cheaper ones, Netgear, Asus, there's cheaper Cisco ones, uh, Daytech, many others. But what they do is they take over that router at the edge of your network, and then the malware takes full control of connected devices. They're so running Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, according to researchers, just within the last couple of weeks. High level of sophistication. Hey, make sure you get that insider show notes that I've mentioned here a few times today. CraigPeterson.org, or com, I should say, CraigPeterson.com. And also, if you have any questions, just email me, M E, at CraigPeterson.com, and I will try and get back with you. Take care. You're worried about surveillance. Hey, I'm worried about surveillance. And it turns out that there's a secretive company out there that, to prove their mustard, tracked the NSA. <laughs> yeah, fun thing. 
This is a company that is kind of scary. We've talked before about a couple of these scary guys. There's this Israeli company called NSO Group. And this, is, this NSO Group is absolutely incredible what they've been doing, who they'll sell to. These guys are a company that sells cell phones, smartphone exploits to its customers and they are alleged to have sold their software to a variety of human rights abusers we're talking about nso group coming up with what we would term kind of a zero day hack against iphones against android phones against pretty much anything out there so in other words, a hack that no one's ever seen before, and then use that in order to get into the phone and find information. They've used things like the, I think it was WhatsApp and video that was sent and use that to hack Saudi Arabian phones. You might remember Khashoggi, this uh, so-called journalist, I guess he kind of was, who apparently was murdered by them, right? Big big problem so this israeli group yeah yeah they sell to anybody that's willing to pay at least that's what the allegations are i've never tried to buy their stuff but yeah they're assisting government with hacks with the ultimate in surveillance another one clearview we've talked about them on the show before this is a company that has done all kinds of illegal stuff now some of it's uh, technically not illegal they're against the terms of usage what clearview has done and now they've gotten involved in this russian ukrainian war that's been going on here they've gotten involved with a number of legal cases in the u.s what they did is they said, okay, well, great, let's do something. Well, you remember Facebook, right, guys? You've heard of that before. And how Facebook got started. Muck Zuckerberg, <laughs> Muck, uh, went ahead and stole the pictures of the women that were in Harvard's catalog, right? Now, when I, when I say catalog, okay, this isn't like a catalog of women, you know, order one mail order type thing we're talking about their index their contacts right there is a catalog of all of the students that are there in the school so zuckerberg goes and grabs those against policy okay maybe it wasn't strictly against policy at the time and then he puts up something called the facebook where people can look at a picture of a girl and decide whether or not she should get a five or a ten or a one right yeah that sort of stuff uh, abusing people that that really is abuse I, I can't imagine the way people felt at seeing their ratings by people that didn't know them that somehow their def definition of beauty really defines who they are it's it's crazy what the stuff he did right so he started his business by stealing stuff microsoft started his business by what well by going ahead and misrepresenting some would say lying to IBM about what he had as far as an operating system goes, right? Again and again and again, we're seeing dishonest people getting involved doing dishonest things to get their companies off of the ground. And I have a friend who's an attorney who says, and Craig, that's why you will never be wealthy, because you just wouldn't do any of that stuff. So Clearview is another example of these types of companies. In this case, Clearview went to Facebook and crawled any page it could get its little grubby crawlers on. So it found your public fa Facebook page. It went all over the internet. There's a number of websites, some are out of business now, but that you upload your pictures to, you people can rate them, can share them, you can share them. Hey, you got your own photo gallery here that you can share with friends and a million other people right that that's what ended up happening that's how those guys made the money right they're selling you on hey you can look at how convenient this is you can have your own little uh, photo gallery and you can take that photo photo gallery and uh, share it with your friends and then if you read the fine print it's hey and we'll make money off of showing your pictures and showing ads well <laughs> 
Clearview went and scanned every website it could get its grubby little scanners on, crawled through them all, downloaded pictures of any face that it could find, and then went ahead and digitized information about people's faces. So it spent years scraping and then it put together its technology, facial recognition technology, and went to the next level, which is, hey, police department, get my app. So you can get the Clearview app and you encounter someone, you can take a picture of them and upload it, which now gives them another face, doesn't it? And then once it's uploaded, it'll compare it and it'll say, okay, found the guy, here he is. So with the Russia-Ukrainian war, what they were doing is taking pictures of uh, dead and injured Russian soldiers, running them through this database online of all of these faces, found out who they were, and went so far as to use other stolen data online. Now, this is war, right? The whole thing is crazy. But the stolen database online found out who their mothers were, the phone numbers for the mothers and have people all over the world sending text messages to mom about their dead son yeah okay so clearview sells it to police departments they sell it to uh, pretty much the highest bidder they say hey listen we, 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 we don't do that come on right now there's other data brokers and i've had a few on my show in the past who are using harvested information from phone apps to provide location data to law enforcement so that they can then circumvent what what well you have a right to privacy don't you it's codified right in the Bill of Rights, those first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And it was also uh, defined by the Supreme Court's Carpenter decision. So we have protections in the Constitution, natural rights, that were confirmed by the Supreme Court that say, hey, the federal government, you cannot track all of the citizens. You can't track what they're doing. You can't harvest their information. And yet, at the same time, they go to the data brokers that have put together all of these face pictures, figured out who your friends are. You know, you know, you sign up for Facebook and it says, hey, you want me to find your friends, see if they're already on Facebook? Just, just hit yes here and upload your contact list. So up goes Facebook says, oh, look at all your friends we found. Isn't this exciting? And in the meantime, in the background, Facebook is looking at all of this data and saying, ha, ha, we now know who your friends are. And so uh, many people have wondered, well, wait a minute, I didn't talk about... Um, I didn't do a search for Product X online, and yet I'm getting ads for Product X. Well, did you mention it to a friend who might have done a search for it? Because these search engines, these companies like Facebook, know who your friends are, what they're interested in, and they'll sell ads to people who are going to promote to you the same items they're promoting to your friends, right? It's absolutely crazy. So this company... It's called A6, and they're very, very quiet, very low-key. The website doesn't say anything at all, but they took their software that's pulling all of this data together and compiling it, and, and A6 pointed all of this technology towards the National Security Agency and the CIA and use their own cell phones against them. Now, why did they do this? They didn't do it to prove something about how, you know, you shouldn't allow this sort of thing to happen. And they didn't do it to prove that, man, we got to have tighter controls because look at what we can do. If we can do it, other people can do it. No, 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 no. According to audio-visual presentations and recordings of an ASICS presentation reviewed by The Intercept and Tech Inquiry, ASICS claimed that it can track roughly 3 billion devices in real time. That's equivalent to a fifth of the world's population. 
You're not going to find anything out about A6. It's called Anomaly 6. Good luck online. If you find it, let me know. Me at craigpeterson.com. I'd love to know more about these guys. The only thing on the website for them is an email address. And A6, Anomaly 6, in that presentation showed the nation spooks exactly what A6 knew about them. All right. Uh, apparently, A6 is also ignoring questions from journalists and will only respond to emails from people in upper levels of federal agencies, which means, and maybe this is a supposition from our friends over at TechDirt, I don't know. But what that means is they're looking to sell your information in real time to the feds to get around the Carpenter decision and the Constitution. Just absolutely amazing. Hey, go online right now, craigpeterson.com. I'll send you my special report on passwords and my two other most popular, craigpeterson.com. Stick around. Have you ever wondered about search engines? Which ones should you be using? You're not alone. It's probably the number one question I get from people. What should I use? Well, Google is falling behind, but we're going to talk about the top engines and the whys. Google has been an amazing company moving up. Of course, you know, we are just talking about the cheats so many companies have taken over the years. And Google has certainly had its share of cheats. I haven't seen anything about them just doing completely underhanded things to get started. I think they were pretty straightforward. They had a great idea back in the beginning where they were just looking at links. How many sites linked into this one particular site and that gave this concept of a page rank very simple very easy to do of course there are problems with that because you would end up with pages that are older having more links to them etc and they have over the years really improved themselves but we also have some other problems right now with Google. If you do searches on Google for a number of different topics, uh, and you'll, you'll see that really Google search quality has deteriorated in recent years. We've talked before here about some of the problems with Google and elections and how they have obviously gone out of their way to influence elections. There's a study down in, done in Orange County, California, or at least about Orange County, California, and an election down there showed that Google had a major influence on that election and also tilted it a certain way on purpose. Absolutely amazing. So that's one way Google has kind of fallen behind. But you can look at at all kinds of searches and hope you're going to get a great response. And you don't. Have you noticed that? It's gotten worse. And then on top of it, you're starting to see more ads squeezed in. It is not great. Uh, I have used it, of course, for programming in years past. Before that, I liked AltaVista, which was a digital equipment corporation product. AltaVista was pretty darn good. And you could use Boolean logic with it. Google says, well, you can use Boolean with us, but it's not the same. Google's is very, very simple. But at any rate, they have not made any great leaps here going forward. It's been absolutely amazing. So let's go through the search engines. I'm going to give you right now the pros and cons to some of these search engines out there. So we started with Google. It is the 800 pound gorilla. And in case you didn't know, this number two overall search engine is YouTube. Okay. But let's stick with straight searches, not video searches. So what is great about Google? Well, one of the big things is they like fresh content. So if you're looking to do search engine optimization for your business, you are best off having some keystone pages. So having these pages that are kept up to date. 
So you might have a page on uh, whatever it might be, hacking, VPNs, right? Uh, and you make sure you update it because Google does favor the fresh content. They rank blogs and services, which is really nice. And they're accessible in any device. They have apps. They work well on a browser. And I'm, I'm right now I'm looking at an article by LifeWire.com on the best search engine. So you'll see some of this information there. What they don't like about it is the same thing you don't, right? Which is it collects all kinds of data on you. They also have hidden content that, that uh, might damage your ranking as a business or someone who has a website. And the search delivers too many results. You know, you see millions of results. Well, yeah, there probably are millions of results for a single search. But what I want are the really relevant ones. And Google learns over time what kind of results that you want, which is kudos to them. But they are tone deaf sometimes, frankly, as well. Okay, our number two on our list of top eight is DuckDuckGo. Now, I've been talking about them for quite a while, and some people have been kind of disparaging DuckDuckGo lately. And the, the reason is they say, well... The search results maybe are a, a little wrong, right? They are uh, maybe doing a little censoring, not as much as Google does, but some. Well, at first, DuckDuckGo.com is where you'll find them online, named after that kid's game, is a privacy search engine. So it is not tracking or storing any information about you. That's a very big one. Their searches are very fast, but they're backed. The actual back-end search engine is Bing, which is Microsoft. We're going to get to that in a couple of minutes here. That means that if Microsoft is deciding to do some waiting on search results based on their political views, then that's going to show up in DuckDuckGo. But it's nowhere near as bad, and I've talked about it on the show before. We've done some examples. So it is also now giving you the option to restrict your searches to the last month worth of results, which is really nice. That keeps a little more up to date. They also aren't great at image searches, no personalized results, and it is free, which is nice. You might also want to look at Quant, Q-W-A-N-T, if you're looking at a private or privacy browser quant is a french company but it, it does english as well okay english results bing they like the older and well-established web pages they rank home pages they do not rank blogs they crawl all kinds of hidden content and non-hidden equally unlike google which is really great uh, bing is not great at forums as i mentioned blogs they're not as fast as Google, and they have some seriously heavy search result screens. Dogpile, they've been around for quite a while. You might want to check them out. They have something called fetches and favorite fetches. So you can have a home screen when you go to Dogpile, and you'll see right there uh, your favorite searches, and they're right there for you. You can just keep going to them. They use multiple databases so they can get broad results, multiple backend search engines, and there's no home screen personalization available with it, and lots of sponsored results, which isn't a real big deal, but you'll find them online at dogpile.com. Google Scholar Search. I've used this a number of times. If you're looking for scholarly articles, it is really good. You can get citations in various styles if you are working on your master's, PhD, whatever it might be, and they're imposing a style in the document that you're writing. So you can put it into the bibliography. And uh, they, they got a lot of great stuff. Google Scholar, you'll find online at scholar.google.com. Webopedia Search. It focuses on technical terms and applications, which is kind of good, friendly to non-tech users, and it is only searching Webopedia's 10,000 word and phrase database, so that's pretty good to, uh, to understand, too. Yahoo Search. 
They have a home screen, has news, trending topics. I, I've used Yahoo. Of course, it's not what it used to be, but it does have everything right there, even your horoscope. And the ads are not marked out clearly. And then there's the Internet Archive search. This is actually a site that I fund. I, I donate money to them every month. And you'll find them at archive.org. But it is really, really cool. You can search based on time frames. Again, if you are doing papers, if you're a journalist, etc., you can find what was the internet like or what was this web page like? What was it like around Hurricane Katrina in 2005? Right there. You'll find it online at archive.org. Hey, stick around. We'll be right back. You already know that hackers are coming after you. We've talked about how they are out there scraping web pages, putting together stuff. Well, I want to bring up again the Ukraine Russian war and Russia leaking data like a sieve. Hi, if you've ever wondered who I am, I'm Craig Peterson. We've met before. I'm your chief information security officer. Well, Russia, Russia, Russia. It, it is, of course, in the news again. It seems like it's been in the news for how long now? Six years, maybe longer. In this case, we're going to talk about what the hackers are doing, because they're not just doing it to Russia. They're doing it to us, and it's a problem. We're going to explain why. You've heard of doxing before, D-O-X-X-I-N-G, to dox someone which is basically to find documentation about people and to release it. That's really a part of it, frankly. So you've seen some political operatives who have gone online and, and doxed people. For instance, uh, one of them is Libs of TikTok. You might have heard of that one. And this is where they take all of these crazy things that crazy people uh, on TikTok go ahead and publish and just put excerpts of them together. They don't like cut it up to make them look crazy. No, no, no. They let them be crazy all <laughs> all by themselves and put it online so some libs decided hey we don't like this and uh, a so-called journalist who had been complaining about doxing before that it shouldn't be done and it's unethical it should be illegal yeah what does she do she goes and doxes the lady that was running libs of tiktok <laughs> And it, I, it just it blows my mind here. How can these people be so two-faced? They really are just crazy, crazy two-faced. So she went ahead and did what she said should never be done. And I'm sure she had some form of justification for it and put it out online. So uh, online comes this lady's home address, her name, all kinds of stuff. And that's available online right now. Now, you might want to try and do something that I've done before, which is if you go to one of these data brokers, you see ads for these things, right? Like a, do a search for yourself with us and have a look at how accurate that information is. When I looked last time I looked, because I had a few data brokers on the radio show, I would say less than a third of the information that they claimed was information about me was actually accurate, less than a third, frankly. And I don't think that's a particularly, what's the word I'm looking for, but um, unique situation. Let me put it that way. I don't think it's unique at all. I think they get a lot of it wrong because remember, they're trying to piece together this, piece together that, and put it all together. So you, you can't 100% rely on any of that stuff. And as I said, for me, it wasn't particularly accurate. Well, now let's move into war. Ukraine has claimed to have doxed Russian troops as well as FSB spies. You remember them from the Soviet Union? They still exist, right? And hacktivists actually have official scheduled meetings and are leaking private information from various Russian organizations and Russian people. 
So we're talking about things like their names, birth dates, passport numbers, job titles. And the personal information that they have released about these Russian companies and people goes on for pages here. It looks like, frankly, any data breach. You'll find a great article about this that I'm referring to in Wired.com. But this particular data set can change personal information on 1,600 Russian troops who served in Buchka, a Ukrainian city that's been attacked by Russia. And by the way, you've probably seen these things. There were all kinds of uh, accusations here of multiple potential war crimes. What was going on over there? So this data set's not the only one. There's another one that allegedly, allegedly, (laughs) allegedly contains the names and contact details of 620 Russian spies who are registered to work at the Moscow office of the FSB. That is Russia's main security agency. Now, this information wasn't released by hackers in North Korea or hackers in the U.S. or Russia, because we already know Russian hackers don't attack Russia. They're not stupid. Okay, They don't want Putin coming after them. But this was published by Ukraine's intelligence services. So all of these names, all of these personal details, birth dates, passport numbers, job titles, where they're from, all kinds of stuff, freely available online to anyone who cares to look. Now, Ukrainian officials wrote in a Facebook post (laughs) as they published the data that every European should know their names. So you got to bet there are a lot of people kind of freaking out over there. Absolutely, absolutely freaking out. Uh, In Russia, that is. So since the Russians invaded Ukraine, there have been huge amounts of information about Russia itself, the Russian government's activities and companies in Russia, these oligarchs that are over there. And it's all been made public. So it's very interesting because these have been closed off private institutions in the U.S. Yeah, we do do some hacking of potential adversaries, but they don't release it. All right. Uh, Not at all. But there's really two types of data here. First of all, you've got the information that the Russian authorities are publishing, their allies are publishing, and then you've got the hacktivists. These companies, these groups, I should say, like Anonymous. Hundreds of gigabytes of files and millions of emails have been made public, including some of the largest companies within Russia. I mean, the big guys, oil and gas companies, uh, lumber companies, etc., etc. So there's a former British colonel in the military intelligence that Wired is quoting here. His name's Philip Ingram. And he said, both sides in this conflict are very good at information operations. The Russians are quite blatant about the lies that they'll tell. We're used to that, aren't we? And uh, much of the Russian disinformation has been debunked. But they say they have to make sure that what they're putting out is credible and they're not caught telling out right lies in a way that would embarrass them or embarrass their international partners. So it's really quite interesting. We've started seeing this stuff coming out in March 2022, of course, right? And it's hard to tell how accurate the data is. It looks probably pretty accurate. It has been scooped up, as I mentioned on the show before, by... Uh, Some hacktivists, one of whom has put together an app that anyone can download and it allows you to send text to the mothers of Russian soldiers, some alive, some dead, and it automatically translated into Russian. I, I assume it's kind of a crude translation, but whatever, right? So you can harass some poor a babushka over there in Russia whose grandson is out there fighting. This is just incredible. We've never seen anything like any of this before. But doxing, very toxic online behavior. And when it comes to war, the gloves are off, right?
And by the way, these groups that I mentioned, these hacktivists, have official meetings Tuesday mornings on Telegram. And they talk about who the next target is. Absolutely amazing. Make sure you visit me online, craigpeterson.com, and don't go anywhere. Because we've got more coming up here about organizations in general here in the U.S. Breaches are up, stolen data are up, and the number of bankruptcies are up because of it. Hacks are up. You know that. We've known that for a while. But did you know that that is not necessarily the number one reason businesses are suffering breaches? So we're going to talk about that right now. What else do you have? We've talked before about some of the websites that I keep an eye on. One of them is called Dark Reading, and they've got a lot of good stuff. Some of the stuff I don't really agree with, but, you know, who agrees with everybody or another person, just one even, 100% of the time? Like, no one, okay? So, in this case, we're talking about organizations suffering a breach, and the stat that they're quoting here is that more than 60 Six zero percent of organizations have suffered a breach in the last 12 months. That's huge. And the breaches have gotten more expensive. Global average breach cost is $2.4 million. And if you are unprepared to respond to a compromise, that price tag increases to $3 million. Yeah, that's how bad it is. That's what's going on out there right now. But the point that really they're trying to make here at Dark Reading in this article by Robert Lemos is that organizations are focused too narrowly on external attackers when it's insiders, third parties, and stolen assets that cause many breaches. That's what this new study is showing from Forrester Research. Now, I had them on the show a few times in the past. You might be familiar with them. They are a research company that charges a lot for very little information. But, you know, they've they've got the research to back it up, right? They're, They're really one of the leading, if not the leading research company out there. So last month, they came out with the 2021 State of Enterprise Breaches Report. And they found that the number of breaches and the cost of breaches varied widely, depending on where the organization is based. And the big one that you have control over is whether they were prepared to respond to breaches. Now, companies in North America had the largest disparity between the haves and have-nots. Listen to these numbers. They're bad for businesses, these numbers, and they're worse for individuals. The average organization required 38 days, 38 days, over a month on average, to find, eradicate, and recover from a breach. But companies that were not prepared for security challenges took 62 days. Now, the good news here is that this is down. It used to take nine months on average, and now we're down to two months. But here's the big question for you. Can you or can a company survive 62 days, or is it going to be out of business, right? Do you have enough money to make payroll for the next two months? That's where the problem really starts to come in. That's why small businesses that are hacked, small businesses that are using things like Norton or some of the other real basic software without having a a good firewall and and good security practices, uh, and same thing with individuals here, uh, you are going to be out of business. Odds are, right? That's what they're showing right now. And your insurance policy that you have for cybersecurity insurance will not pay out. I did a presentation for an insurance industry group. Uh, This was in Massachusetts, and it was a statewide group. And we talked about 
how they are not paying out. The companies aren't, right? And why? And if you are not prepared, if you are not doing the right things, and I can send you a list of what you need to be doing if you'd like. Just email me at craigpeterson.com. Be glad to send it to you. Me, M-E, at craigpeterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N.com. And just ask for it, and I'll, I'll respond to you. Or we'll get Mary or someone else to forward it to you because I've already got it. Okay, this isn't a big deal for me. Okay, (laughs) it's ready to go. But um, that list is an important list because if you don't meet the standards that the insurance industry has set forward and you are a hack, they're not going to pay you a dime, even if you sue them. And we've seen this with very large companies as well, where they're trying to recover tens of millions of dollars from the insurance policy and they didn't get a dime they had to also pay who knows how many millions to lawyers to sue the insurance companies and they lost okay it's a very very big deal so there's a a huge misalignment according to Forrester between the expectation and the reality of breaches on a global scale there's a big disparity of about six hundred thousand dollars between those who are prepared to respond to a breach and those who are not and uh, we can talk about that as well because there, there's things you need to do obviously backup but backup means you've got to check the backup you've got to make sure it's valid you should be spinning up the backups on in a virtual environment in order to make sure the backups are good there's a lot of things you should be doing okay and uh, that's just a part of it plus do you have your pr people ready are you able to respond to the state requirements a lot of states now if you are hacked require you to report it to the state in some cases in as little as 72 hours so do you have that paperwork ready do you have the phone numbers of all of the people that are on the team ready okay all of these things now the threats are not just the external hackers anybody who's trying to protect their data is focused on obviously the external hackers that's where we tend to focus part one part two is we focus in on the people that are working inside the company right it's kind of a zero trust narrative here why is this guy in sales trying to get into the engineering files why are they trying to get into payroll right you you understand where i'm going with this you buying what i'm selling you don't want them to have access to stuff that they don't need access so the attacks that forrester found were spread over external attacks internal incidents third party and supply chain attacks which is really big nowadays and lost or stolen assets globally half of companies consider external attacks to be this top threat But in reality, only a third of the incidents come from external actors. Nearly a quarter of them are traced back to an internal event, while 23% consisted of lost or stolen assets, and 21% involved a third-party partner. Interesting, eh? So we've got to keep an eye on this. These external attacks are a very big deal. And that's where they have success with what are called zero-day attacks. But your internal people can be a problem. Now, I have put together 2022. This is something really, really important. What we call a POANM. It's a plan of action and milestones of what you need to be doing for your cybersecurity. okay this is available absolutely free you have to email me me at craigpeterson.com but the idea behind this is it's a spreadsheet that you can use in numbers on a mac or excel on windows and it has all of the key items now we follow what's called the nist 800-171 standard this is the national institute of standards and technology and they've laid out uh, all of the different things 
that you should be doing. Now, we've broken them down into eight cybersecurity activators is what we called them. And we have, you should have already gotten an email this week from me if you're on my email list, just talking about, because we're starting now, getting into the cybersecurity activators. I'm showing you what to do about each one of them so you can do it yourself, right? So many of us are stuck with being the, the CTO or the guy or gal in charge of IT just because we like computers or we know more than somebody else, right? So if you're on my email list, you will be getting these things automatically. We're going to be going through them in the weeks ahead. Little, little quick mini micro trainings, if you will. But you got to be on the email list in order to get them. These are also appropriate for home users, right? Now, you're going to have to make your decisions as to what you're going to do. But home users have the same exposure, the same basic problems that they have in bigger organizations out there. So I follow the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. They have broken it down into a number of different sections. They actually require it. And if you are compliant with this, with this NIST standard, uh, you are going to be able to recover your money from the insurance company if you are hacked. I don't know. I was going to say if or when, but um, you know, hopefully you won't get hacked because of this. So it, it's an important thing to follow. So make sure you go to craigpeterson.com slash subscribe right now and get subscribed. A lot of stuff for home users. You know my business is focused on securing businesses, particularly regulated businesses, right? If you have intellectual property, you don't want to have stolen. If you do government contracts where they're requiring you to be uh, uh, compliant with this NIST standard or some of the others, but it's basic stuff that every business should be following. So just email me, me at craigpeterson.com with your questions. We've been really good at answering them. We've probably lately been averaging about a dozen a day, which is quite a few. But so it might take us a little bit to get back to you, but we've gotten much better. Mary, her, her number one responsibility right now is making sure that we answer all of your emails. We'll send out this plan of action and milestone spreadsheet for you so you know what to do. This is updated. This is 2022. Everything you need right there. Me at craigpeterson.com. All right. You'll also find my podcast there at craigpeterson.com. And I want to point out that I'm not doing the show on video anymore. It just wasn't getting enough traction with it, and it just takes too long. Anyways, craigpeterson.com. <laughs>